Thank you for listening to this message from the ministry of Morse Corner Church in Leverett, Massachusetts. Morse Corner is a non-denominational church and is committed to the preaching and teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our church was founded in 1896 by two students of the famous evangelist D.L. Moody. We seek to encourage and edify the body of Christ through the proclamation of God's word through the ministries of the local church. If you'd like more information, visit our website, morriscornerchurch.com. We hope you enjoy the message. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So this is very similar to what Paul said in Galatians 5. And this is why the law of God was given, the thou shalt nots were given to show people exactly what God thinks. If we didn't have the commandments of God, how would you know? There would be some things we know instinctively because of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You wouldn't want, you wouldn't want someone doing this to you so you know it's wrong. But without the law of God, we really wouldn't know all of these things. So the law was added. See if you remember. This is what? Back in chapter... And I forget where it is, but never mind that. The law was added. Why? Where was it? Mark, help me out. <laughs> Chapter 2. Okay, the law was added because of Transgression. transgressions. Right. The law was added because of transgressions. So, yeah, you can say, well, I've never done this and I've never done that. Yeah, but you've done this over here and that over there. And the law of God is given for one purpose, to show you that you're a sinner. That was why God gave the law to Israel, to show them you can't keep it. And if they would simply plead with the Lord for his mercy, he would have been merciful, and he often was merciful. So that's the bad news of the gospel, that all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. But what's the good news? Because we're New Testament Christians and we're about what? The good news. Now the good news doesn't make any sense without the bad news. You have to lay that foundation first. But the good news is that God demonstrated his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Jesus was sent into the world not to save the righteous, the righteous don't need saving. Of course, there's none righteous. No, not one. Christ came into the world to save sinners. And at one point, Paul said, and I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the chief of sinners. So that's the good news of the gospel. Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world's already condemned. You say, prove it. Everything decays. Everything breaks down. Everything, everybody dies. That's proof that the world is under the curse. That should be evident. So Jesus came not to condemn. The world is already condemned. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And many of the people in the churches of Galatia and Corinth, they were delivered. Look at verse 11. So he goes through all this list of one sin after another. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then what does he say in verse 11? And such were what? Some of you. Some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You know, Morris Corner Church is not about condemnation. Morris Corner Church is about redemption. Morris Corner Church and every, every church should be about God's grace and preaching God's grace, that it's not, it's not too late for anyone if they would turn to Christ. He says, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit 
of our God. So the only way a person can be justified is by their works, by trying really hard to be nice and kind. No, it's only through faith in the gospel and justified by the Spirit. Now, how does a person know whether or not they have the Holy Spirit? I, you know, so, a few people have asked me throughout the years, how do I know if I have the Holy Spirit? There are some churches that would teach that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues. Well, I don't uh, agree with that. We, that's a different sermon for another day. Uh, other people would say the evidence of the Holy Spirit is miracles. So if the Holy Spirit is present in this congregation, we're going to be seeing miracles. Well, you know, again, that's another sermon for another day. I mean, that's just simply not the case. Miracles are very rare in the Bible. So what is the evidence of the Holy Spirit? How do you know? What's the Holy Spirit's job? It's in the name to make, to, make some, to make God's people holy, right? Sanctification. Sanctification. The evidence that a person has the Holy Spirit, I believe there's more to be said, but the evidence is threefold. Number one, the Holy Spirit will change your mind about sin. Number two, the Holy Spirit will change your mind about Christ. At one point, you didn't want anything to do with Christ. You didn't believe in Christ. You'll change your mind about Christ. And then number three, that will produce in you a growing hatred of sin. It doesn't mean you'll never do it, but it'll produce a growing hatred of sin and a growing love for the things of God. That's the evidence of the Holy Spirit. And isn't that what we want? Every true believer knows that. You know, you may struggle with things in your life. You don't want to struggle with those things. You want victory over those things. Amen? Amen. This is what we want. In our spirit, the Christian desires a life of holiness and righteousness. Are you there yet? Well, you've been set. If you're saved, you've been set apart by God. You can, can be said that you are holy. But are you where you want to be? No. See, the thing is, sin is always going to be present until one of two things happens. Number one, Jesus comes back and translates you. Or number two, you die and shed this sinful flesh. Until then, it's going to be a constant battle. A constant battle. I find that, let's turn to Romans 7 because I, I think this is something that really weighs a lot of people down. And I've heard preaching out there, and this is, this is what I'm hearing from some preachers, and I don't ever want you to get this impression, because on the one hand, we're not making excuses for sin. Well, hey, nobody's perfect, so, you know, uh, we're not making excuses. We've talked about license, this idea that you can't just say you believe in Jesus and go and do whatever you want and think that's fine. But on the other hand, I hear some preachers out there, you would get the idea that if there's any sin in your life or any struggle in your life, you're not even saved. Have you ever heard preaching like this? I hope you've never heard this, or maybe you've, I don't know how people interpret things that I say. But the idea that, well, if I still sin, am I saved? Because I still sin. I had somebody ask me, not in this church, but a couple weeks ago, they said, you know, I still have these thoughts come into my mind. I still have these desires, things that I want to do. And I've even given in once or twice. How can I be saved if I'm having these feelings and thoughts? You know, the fact that it bothers the person is a really good sign. Yeah, but those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at that person, what they did. Look at that person, what they said. I don't even think they're saved. You've heard this? Was the Apostle Paul saved? Look at Romans 7, starting in verse 14. This may shock you, but Paul said that he practiced sin. I guess some people are going to hear this. Well, Pat, you're, you're providing excuses for people to sin. That's not what I'm doing. I'm reading the Bible, okay? Romans 7, 14 through 20, Paul writes, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I 
am what? Carnal. There's some people who say, oh, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, that's funny because Paul said, I'm carnal. Of course, he wrote to the Corinthians that they were acting carnal. But I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Can you relate to that at all? Amen. Yep. We can all pretend that we walk on water, but <laughs> you know, you might fool someone else. I don't. I don't think so. But you're not going to fool God. He says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that that is good. It is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. Pay attention to this. He says, for the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, what? That I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, that it dwell in his flesh. These are the words, this is the testimony of an honest Christian saint who knew the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. You know, some of these churches that have the artwork and the stained glass where the apostles have this glowing halo around their head, that's not the way it really was. <laughs> they were more like you than that. <laughs> this is honesty. One translation renders verse 19 this way. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. There's Christians out there who will claim, or again, this is what it sounds like, what they're saying. There are Christians out there who claim they don't do anything wrong. You know what you call that? You, you know what you call them? Liars. <laughs> Unless they're more godly than the Apostle Paul, and I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Paul says in verse 19, the evil I will not to do that I practice. So think about this. Those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul over here in Romans is saying these, well, whatever the sins were, um, he says that I practice. They say, well, it's a different Greek word, right? It's not, it doesn't mean practice. It's just a bad translation. You know what? It's the same Greek word. Same Greek word translated practice in Romans 7 is the same as in Galatians 5. So how do, you, how do you reconcile this? This is a bit of a paradox, right? Did you see the problem, potential problem? I think the Catholic Church um, has tried to solve this uh, by saying that, you know, there are venial sins and then mortal sins. So if Paul was struggling with sin, it must have been venial sins that really weren't that big of a deal. You know, those who are practicing mortal sins, you know, it's them that won't inherit the kingdom. Correct me if I'm wrong, Adam plunged the entire human race into sin by eating a piece of fruit that God told him not to eat. So excuse me if I don't see the difference between venial and mortal sin in the Bible. So then how do we explain this paradox? Uh, here's one thing I do know. When a Christian sins... A believer feels guilty. A believer feels bad about it. A believer really, in their spirit, they don't want to do it. When an unbeliever sins, sometimes they love it. And they're going to tell you about how much they love it. Thanks for listening. I'm Pastor Michael Grant from Morris Cornick Church. If you'd like to listen to the complete message, or if you'd like more information about the ministry, visit our website, morriscornickchurch.com. And we'd love to have you join us some Sunday morning here in Leverett. Until next time, may the grace of God be with you.